Hi everyone, my name is Joris Peels and welcome to this webinar. What we're going to be talking about today is, well, 3DX Tech's parts to pe or pellets to parts program. So this is a way for 3DX Tech to get you to use either the polymers that you already have and turn them into the 3D printed material extrusion parts or to develop new and innovative materials that don't exist yet for um, you know, new applications and new parts that uh, cannot be made at the moment. And uh, so who is 3DX Tech now? They're going to go into a presentation course, talk about what they are and what they're doing. But a little bit of a little bit of an overview for those you may not know. A company started in 2014 to making pellets and filament for material extrusion, 3D printing and additive manufacturing uh, machines. So they uh, make a lot of materials from materials for e who are AESD safe, for example, to really kind of engineering plastics or kind of even maybe bulk plastic materials. But they're really known for their ultra high performance materials, things like peak and pack, um, Altem materials that are, are really kind of keep on going when all the other polymers in the world don't work very well anymore. Um, uh, you know, they even have some materials such as TPI and stuff like that. And so, you know, it, they're really the pinnacle of the performance uh, uh, spectrum of, of uh, you know, of polymers in, in the material extrusion space. And that gets them in touch with lots of customers and lots of needs and it led to them to actually make their own printer as well. So they have a their materials company that also has a gearbox uh, 3D printer as well on offer. So they're going to tell you about that. Uh, and who are going to tell you those things? Well, there's two people. There's Brandon Funky and Matt Hewlett. So Brandon is the uh, in charge of a product development uh, at 3DX Tech. He's a Bachelor of Science in Plastics and Polymer Engineering. Uh, he started Application Engineering, which is a great place to start because a lot of people interested in the space are into uh, Application Engineering. I worked on automotive firms, all that kind of thing, developing uh, parts <clears throat> and products and uh, new applications and in injection molding. And then he moved to 3D X Tech <clears throat> in, in 2019. And with him is also Matt Hewlett. And uh, Matt uh, is actually a founder of 3D X Tech. Uh, they're a chief materials engineer. He's got 30 years working in composites, polymers, uh, and additive manufacturing. And uh, uh, yeah, and then that's the team we have for you today. And uh, so I'd like to welcome the guys to the show today. And uh, well, please ask you any questions you want. Uh, please, uh, we'll answer these questions at the very end of the presentation. And do think of some things you'd like to know. So you've got some very experienced gentlemen for you today. And uh, yeah, they can ask you a lot of questions about, especially these kind of really rare materials like peak and pack and filled materials that are you know very interesting on the performance side of things, but maybe very difficult to process in a lot of cases. So please use... Uh, them and use their extensive knowledge and uh, yeah i'd like to give it over to the 3d x tech team and uh welcome the guys to the show and uh yeah uh have a great show guys yeah great thank you joris appreciate it um and thanks everybody for attending today uh, hopefully we'll keep it uh relatively brief and and definitely interesting for you also there'll be a, a pretty extensive or we're going to allow a bunch of time at the end uh to be able to answer any questions you have so there's a chat function in this that you can send some questions, but also uh, we've, we've made sure to uh, keep a, a fair amount of time at the end to be able to answer any questions that you have. Okay, so Joris did a pretty good job of this, but I uh, founded the company in 14 and then have uh, 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 started to, to kind of move on. So my, you'll see some of that later, senior advisor. Uh, Brandon uh, has been with us on and off since really the beginning of the company, but uh, joined formally and full-time in 19. And uh, he's had a couple different positions, salesman, sales manager, and now new product development. And uh, he has taken on this pellets to parts project as, as his project that formalizes something that we've done um, throughout the, the history of the business. But he's, he's formalized this into a, a pretty nice project. A little bit about 3DX Tech. Uh, and again, I'm going to keep some of these background slides pretty uh, brief so that we can get to the, the meat of this, but we were founded in Grand Rapids in 2014. Um, again, based largely on a background of materials engineering at big resin companies like Solve, DSM, Bayer. Um, I had experience in carbon nanotubes, carbon fiber, composites. So bringing all those things together and, uh, and, and trying to create innovative materials that at the time, and especially maybe now, uh, nobody was doing then and very few are, are doing now in the, in the uh, depth and the breadth of our product line. Uh, shortly thereafter, we created Triton 3D. Uh, Triton 3D utilizes uh, 
our extrusion technology and our ability to create EEPROM chips um, to make materials that go into the Stratasys FDM systems. So if, for example, are you using Stratasys ABS in your Fortis and uh, you prefer not to spend that kind of money, then you'd use Triton ABS in your Fortis and the chips recognize it. Um, Gearbox in uh, 2018, uh, was really created out of questions from some of our high-end customers. So we were part and parcel to this project, Pellets of Parts. Uh, companies like Lockheed would come in and we would make custom materials for them. Uh, and they would say, hey, this is a really interesting material. Which printer do you recommend? And at the time, we were kind of grasping at straws. We'd pick this company and that company. And uh, they were always kind of you know, half measures and partial solutions to what we wanted to do. And it became really clear if we really wanted to extend the usefulness of our materials, we had to make our own uh, printer platform. And so that's what we did. We started investing into that in 2018. Um, and the first printers here, we full production year in 22, but the first printers went out to our uh, uh, original customers at the end of 21. It coincided with uh, uh, core industrial partners buying the company. Uh, so it's a uh, uh, private equity firm out of Chicago. They were the uh, 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 owner of one of our bigger customers. And so we got introduced uh, via them. And it was a really good fit for a company that really wanted to invest in uh, forward leaning markets and give us the ability to grow faster in this space than we could organically on our own. Um, as this timeline shows, we started to really uh, sell a year's worth of material uh, machines in in uh, 2022. And what was great about that is this, these machines now that we've got quite a few of them out in the field are really starting to pull through, as we had imagined, a lot of film its business. So uh, each one of these customers will be using ESD Altam or ESD PEC, carbon fiber nylons out of our portfolio. And so as we develop more and more print profiles for them, we, you know, no surprise, we'll sell a lot more filament geared specifically to these machines. And then uh, in 23, uh, reacting to some customers who really wanted just a, uh, say, nylon 12 or a carbon fiber nylon or certain you know, carbon fiber grades um, in, a, in a machine that might be a little bit lower cost. Also, we came out with a Gearbox CF2, and this is focused um, really largely on the CF ABS, uh, CF uh, nylon 12s, maybe even some CF um, uh, peaks and packs. But Traditionally, uh, those customers were all geared towards CF-12. Two primary business units, materials and printers. This shows the uh, uh, filaments, but we also um, manufacture pellets for anybody who happens to want some specialty formulas for their uh, pellet fed printers. Uh, but that's not a, a, a core part of what we do. It's, it's really filament extrusion and, and manufacturing is part of it. And then, of course, our, our printer business. Here's... Uh, just a brief slide of, of some of the customers that we've been lucky enough uh, to, uh, to have. And they, they go across a wide um, uh, array of, of different markets. Uh, but these are, these are some of the folks that we've sold machines to, sell a lot of filament to, and uh, that we have uh, just some of them are hands, you know, arm's length transactions. And many of them are real specific um, applications and materials that we built just for them. So a lot of folks have seen this performance pyramid in a, in a lot of slides. I've been in this business for about 30 years and I've seen this in a ton of different permutations. And this generally implies the, um, the type of materials that you can have available in the, in the uh, thermoplastics world. What, what's a little different about this one is each one of these materials are materials we actually manufacture and, and make materials out of. So it's not the, the list of what's possible. These are, these are materials that we offer today. Uh, so on the left would be the amorphous materials, on the right, the semi-crystalline. And as you move up, you move up in performance and cost. Um, you also, you know, move up in, as you move up, it's a little lower volume. Uh, but those, uh, those materials are designed to, to scratch a very specific itch that the materials below it can't. Uh, in each one of those, we have uh, different variations. I think the next slide shows. So we have unreinforced grades of, of quite a few materials. This might not even be inclusive of everything anymore. Um, and then we, we look to modify or augment these materials in functional means by either glass fiber, ESD additives, carbon fiber. We have ceramic grades now. We have some bioactive grades with uh, antibacterial. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that we can do that take an un unreinforced material and then 
stretch its usefulness by, by adding functional additives. The, uh, the box at the bottom, the custom materials, is really where this pellets to parts project was born out of. Uh, we get a lot of customer requests um, for customer specified materials. And that's something we've been doing since the beginning of the business, but this project uh, more formalizes it and, uh, and, and systematizes it for our customers to be able to use more effectively. In one quick slide, wouldn't be doing a good job if I didn't try to push a little bit on our machines. Um, so the Gearbox H22 printer was built really to answer the question of what material, what printer do you recommend to, to print these materials? And uh, it's a big printer, 18 by 18 by 32, 250C build chamber, chamber, and it holds four 4Ks of material in independently uh, maintained uh, chambers to be able to feed to the to build chamber. And then later on, we brought on a filament dryer. These materials eventually get wet and filament dryer uh, can uh, dry up to all Thames and peaks, uh, down to ABSs and, and what have you. And then a maintainer. So you can be able to store these materials long-term, but this maintainer also allows you to feed out of it into systems like the gearbox, or you can even put these in front of a Fortis and feed you know, master reels into a Fortis 900 if you wanted to. So this is kind of the ecosystem of our, of our equipment side of our business. With that uh, brief overview, try to keep it brief, um, leave the rest of this to Brandon on the pellets to parts side of our uh, uh, business. Hey guys, um, thanks for that, Matt. Um, like he said, my name is Brandon. Um, I'm the product development manager here at 3DX Tech. Um, been here for a few years now, full time. I think what my first, uh, first, first days were back in 2014. I was going to school, working here on the weekends. I've done every job pretty much in the in the facility. Now worked my way up to um, to product manager, product development, um, and like he was saying, this is this is the first time that we've really taken a look at this custom material program. And instead of it being a ad hoc one off um, informal service where um, we were just kind of making what the customer needed, uh, we decided to actually formalize this and make the official pellets to parts program where we, people can go through and have a very linear path to creating their own custom formula so that it can be recreated in the future. There's uh, traceability back throughout the whole process. So if you um, if the material worked well and you want to move forward with that project, we can do it again. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a quick video. Um, this will just break down um, just a, a brief overview of the program. It's only about a minute long, and then we'll go into uh, each one of the steps that uh, that it, the video goes on for. In the ever-evolving world of additive manufacturing, 3DX Tech redefines how original equipment manufacturers, or OEMs, approach 3D printing filament development for their specific applications with our new Pellets to Parts program. First, we set up a consultation with our application engineering team to discuss your goals. Second, our product development team will draft an R&D formulation specific to your application. From there, we produce a trial run of your custom filament to be verified. Once the filament passes all our validation tests, we can move forward with one of two options. We supply you with a high temperature capable Gearbox HT2 printer and work with you to develop a profile specific for your custom material. Or we will supply your team with your custom filament to be utilized on your existing FFF 3D printers. At the end of this program, your team has the exact material you need to complete your current project. Yeah, so that was uh, just a brief overview of it. I know it was fast, but we'll go into each one of the steps. Uh, consultation, formulation, formulation, production, validation, and supply here. Um, and then if you guys have any questions, throw it in chat and we'll... Um, uh, I think Doris will um, will go through those uh, after the during the Q and A session. Uh, so consultation is step one, and this is really where the meat of the the involvement um, takes place. Where uh, you and I sit down, uh, talk about what you want to do, and this is where I mean we see everything from, hey, I've got this material, or I already buy your material in natural or black or blue or anything like that, but in order for our internal processes, we'd really like it to be our our green or our yellow or something like that. Uh, we can go as, as basic as that all the way up to a ground up formulation when customers come in and say, 
and I need a material that can withstand X degrees Celsius ex, um, extended exposure, these chemicals, these mechanical properties, or we're looking for specific application um, circa requirements like EMI RFI shielding or uh, plasma shielding or anything like that, um, we can then sit down and say, all right, what, what are we thinking? How do we want to do this? And really build a plan during this consultation phase. Um, with that being said, the more information that you guys can bring to us for that consultation phase, the better we can we can move forward and the faster we can move forward. Um, if we get all that information up front, we can be off to the races and um, we can kind of limit that. Oh, hey, what about what about this aspect? What about this aspect? If we if we bring everything to the front, we can really, really start running. Um, a lot of those important details would be if there's already a base material um, that you guys are thinking of utilizing to say, hey, we've validated this material works really well. Could we try tweaking this formula or tweaking this material to kind of get a little bit of extra performance out of it? Um, that's that's important information. Uh, desired machine um, that you'd like to print on, whether it's RF, um, RHD2 or you already have machines in house or you're getting ready to bring in a different machine. Uh, knowing what machine you're working with allows us to make sure that whatever form material we formulate can actually be processed on that machine. Um, so that if you if you're like, hey, I'm I, the only machine I have available to uh, to me is an Ultimaker or a Prusa, then we know that kind of puts us in a smaller window to say, okay, if this is a pr what a Prusa can run, we now have a general operating window to start formulating into. Um, and then uh, the big ones, if you're looking for a ground up formulation, would be your mechanical requirements, temperature requirements, chemicals, um, and then as well as how much of it you need. So after the for after the consultation phase, uh, we then go into formulation. That's when uh, I take the notes back from our consultation and I meet with with Matt and our production team and purchasing team, and we really start to pull this together and figure out how we're going to make this material and then what a timeline would be to to complete that to bring it all in, depending on um, supply chains. Um, and we can do that because, like uh, Joris and like Matt said earlier. We have that in, we have that knowledge internally. Um, I have an experience in uh, application development for injection molding previously. Matt comes from automotive aerospace on the material side, on the additive side. He's a wealth of knowledge that we tap into. Um, and then on top of that, the support from our uh, our supply chain as well. So that allows us to really, really stack that um, that that bullpen in our favor to say, hey, what's our best shot at getting you? A, a viable material uh, with as little setbacks and as fast as possible. Yeah, I think some of the, these, these projects, you mentioned it, and some of these projects can range from the fairly simple to the, to the pretty complex. On the simple side, uh, but kind of neat, would be um, we've had customers in the past in the um, uh, white goods, I think is what they're called, but the refrigerator manufacturers. So the inside of the refrigerators are often a lot of thermoformed hips. And this specific fridge manufacturer wanted to prototype parts out of their hips. They'd been buying ours and they asked us. So we brought in their hips, made filament. And then now for, for years, they've been uh, prototyping parts on their machines out of the exact hips formula they use for, for production. So it works really well for them. Another example of a more simple one is uh, one of our friends in um, um, uh, in the heavy equipment, if you will. So John Deere, uh, they have a pretty interesting green weatherable material. I think a lot of folks have seen hoods made out of it, of uh, their tractors and what have you. So it's a, I think it's a PC, PBT or, or what have you, but it's, it's their green weatherable material. They wanted to be able to make service parts out of that material. So they shipped us their material. We created an extrusion formula for it, made filaments and sent it back to them and they can print service parts out of their material. So it can be just as kind of easy or benign as that to other customers. We have some aerospace guys that come to us and say, we need a 90% tungsten filled pack for aerospace uh, neutron shield. Okay, well, that's not off the shelf. So let's let's make that for you. Um, there's other ones that, as Brandon mentioned, EMIRF that, uh, that we've been making for customers for a couple of years that we're now allowed to, pretty close to allowed to sell to the to the market. So that'll be coming out soon. But um, if you have real specific needs, um, so far we've done a decent job of, of covering the gambit from just running your 
general purpose, I've got it for injection molding, can you make filament out of it? All the way up to some pretty strange and, and interesting applications uh, that many are actually out in space right now. Yeah, and I think that just lends to, I mean, I know we've said this uh, before, but this is something that we've been doing since the inception of, of 3DX Tech, uh, sitting down, playing with materials, trying to solve the puzzle of what your team needs is, is what we've really enjoyed doing since 2014. Yeah. We just didn't have a, a finalized program for it. And we were able to do it when customers would request it, um, but they had to know we were able to do it to know they could ask us to do it. Yeah. Um, so what this program was is really meant to do is to really broadcast to, to all of you that this is something we've been doing for a long time. This is something that we are really good at and that we we enjoy doing, um, that we think can bring a lot of value um, and to, to make it a little bit more accessible uh, to everyone else out there. So after the formulation has been um, confirmed, we then move to production. Uh, we send the material, we send the formula out, we get it compounded. We then get that the completed single pellet solution in house and our production team schedules the production run, runs the material in filament. While they're doing that, they do run a full design of experiment on, on the machine or on the extrusion line while they're doing this process so that uh, you can see, hey, it, it took me six attempts to really dial in the extruder to be able to con make, to create a consistent uh, throughput of, of filament down the line. And then um, that way we can then log that successful trial run so that if you do need the material again, we can we can recreate the process. Or we've seen this a few times in um, for some materials where a customer comes to us and says, hey, I've got this material that I really want to turn into filament, but we don't know if it'll it'll work. Let's try it out. And then that full DOE that we're able to provide after the production run really helps to show if if we weren't able to produce filament out of it, we can then show the DOE to say, yeah, here's the 10, 12, 15 different extrusion setups that we tried to be able to produce filament, but we weren't we weren't able to uh, to produce anything so that it's not just in the dark happening in a void. Thanks for the money. Thanks for the money. Sorry, we couldn't produce any <laughs> filament. Which has happened. You know, it's just We've, we've created a process around that now so that there's no surprises and um, that everybody gets all the information. And then if there's any other information that your team needs, we had one previously that um, he had some specific requests around the, the exact um, extrusion setup um, that, that was um, relayed to us during the consultation phase so that I could relay that to the production team and everyone involved so that Everyone was on the same page. It was all documented, recorded in the DOE so that it was all covered post process. Yeah, some of this, some of it can get as interesting as reactive extrusion grades that, hey, look, don't uh, don't go over 280C with this material because you might start to kick it over. Um, and we can make filament below that. You know, we may not want to process into parts at that temperature, which is fine. We often extrude at significantly lower temperatures than its printing temperature to make good filament. Uh, but all that information, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the type of material that you're sending us or the, the reactive chemistry, we, we get all that up front so that we can we can follow all the instructions while we're while we're making the filament for you. Yeah. Um, and then here, moving from step three to four is where the path diverts. And this really comes down to which machine are you looking to print this custom material on? Um, if you're looking to print the, to bring in an HT2 um, and print this material on an open source high temperature machine, we then go to step four of validation. Um, if you already have your own existing material machine or you're looking to run it on a pellet fed and you just need needed us to do the compounding, we then jump from production to supply. We make it, we send it out to you. Um, but if you are looking at running this on an HT2, we then skip, we then move to uh, step number four, which is validation. Uh, and this is where once we've produced the material, we then send it over to the other side of the building uh, with our gearbox team and the profiling team over there. They begin to actually start to create a groundwork for a print profile so that when you guys get your HD2 and your new material, it's the groundwork has already been laid for, here's a baseline setting on, here's how to print with the material instead of you having to get your material, your new material with a new machine and say, okay, now I have to figure out how to make both of these work. And what this really does is it, it reduces your ramp up time um, to get moving. 
So with a validated profile from us, it's less time that you guys have to spend uh, messing around with the machine to really fine tune and dial in or at least even get a profile started, uh, which means more printing time. And then once the validation has been completed, um, we then go to supply. Uh, the material has been validated, packaged, dried, uh, it's ready to ship. And then since the formulation has been archived, the process has been, the process parameters have been documented through that DOE. If you need more in the future, we make more. Um, the only caveat to that is we ask for a slight amount of forecasting just because these are typically one batch productions with a compounder or with our, through our supply chain. So if you can give us any kind of, yeah, I, I think I'll need 15 to 20 reels every six weeks, we can then begin to plan around that. Um, if it's, hey, thanks for the material and six months later, hey, can we put in another order for, for 20 more, 30 more reels? We have to kind of restart that process with our uh, supply chain um, to bring that material back in, get it compounded, get it produced into filament and then shipped out. So if we have any kind of forecasting, makes that whole process run a lot smoother if, you, if this is a, a project that will move into the future. Um, but now that, now that the material has been shipped, you guys now have either uh, your material with your machine that you already had, or you have your material with an HD2 and a profile to get you started and not off, off moving. And really, that's really designed for your use case. So ultimately with the 3DX text pellets to parts program, like it says at the bottom, we're saying goodbye to the standard cookie cutter solution of, if I have an application that requires this temperature, you typically you had to say, if I'm over this temperature, I have to choose one of these three materials. But if those three materials didn't check the boxes of everything in your application, what else, where were you going to, where were we going to go with that? Because our application needs X, but X isn't out there. Now we can, now we can make that for you instead of you relying on just what's on the shelf. Uh, mm -hmm. Ultimately your application gets your solution. Anything, Dad? No, here we are. So um, we wanted to leave it open to some uh, um, some questions at the end, but also I wanted to go through this relatively quickly to be good stewards of your time and your day. Uh, so I think we're at that point right now where we can take questions and, and, and uh, open it up to everybody. <clears throat> Great stuff, guys. Very zippy indeed. Very zippy. It's good. It's good. Okay, so uh, let's just uh, a couple of questions uh, that have been coming in and I've had. Uh, first off, for what kind of company is this? Is this is this for a small company? Is it something like Ford? You know, what are we talking about? You know, who, who are you willing to talk to about this program? Is it really suited for like a large corporation or or, or anyone really, depending on their needs? So it's, you know, there's, I mean, there's a cost to it. So what we don't do, I guess, is safe to say if somebody says, "Hey, I just need three rolls of lavender PLA," um, that's probably not what this is. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so our portfolio is is tends to you know um, gear towards the high end. Our customer um, customers range honestly, and we, we love them. Everybody from a guy who just uses our black PLA all the way up through literally we were on conference calls last week with NASA. So there's 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 a whole range of things, but the needs come in from um, a lot of it's 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 we we haven't had consumers, just like general consumers do this project. It's always been companies, but it can be small companies. It can be a guy locally who um, has a compound that he's been doing ex uh, injection molding with, who just wanted to prototype. It was a really small company, probably eight or 10 guys, and they just have this polymer they use. And we, we, we converted that into uh, filament form successfully, and he's got enough now to last him quite a while. Um, all the way up to, like we mentioned earlier, Aerospace Company X that says we need something that has a real specific um, uh, targeted end use. They don't even have a material in mind. They just say, hey, it's got to be flame retardant, uh, ESD, low outgassing for uh, uh, space, and um, you know, a couple different check the box. And, and if it doesn't fit in our current portfolio of offerings, then we got to make something for them. And that's where it gets fun. So it's it's really a gambit, but it it tends to be companies just because you know it's not cheap and um, you know ranges anywhere from three to thirty thousand dollars depending on how easy and little somebody wants. Um, so it just depends on how um, how complex you want to get. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, I like that. I like that. The point I think I, I made it at the beginning as well, and you guys made it as well. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of people that have just, you know, this Covestro grade of PC mm -hmm. they've been using for 30 years, and they're not going to change it for, you know, come hell or high water. And, and this mm -hmm. is also for them to just say, hey, make this into a filament for X printer and X kind of thing. And also, I think for maybe some of the other people, like you did mention, like, okay, if we have, we are processing window differs a little bit if we've got like a, a Prusa MK3 or if you've got a, a kind of another Fortress like system or something like that, you know, just give us a little bit of the idea, like, you know, what are the effects of using different printers or different uh, 3D printer families on, on, on this material? Because you can change it for the printer, right? There's actually significant stuff you could do for the printers as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I just put this, I don't know if this shows up to the, uh, to the group. I just put a different slide up. It does. Mm -hmm. So, um, generally speaking, so say you have an Ultimaker, a Prusa, a Bamboo, or just something, you know, good printers, fine, mm -hmm. fine machines. Um, but the head goes to, uh, let's just say 300 C and it doesn't have a heated chamber. Maybe it's enclosed and it's just passively heated. I would probably, if you can see my mouse, I would probably keep you under the 12 PA 12, maybe mm -hmm. somewhere in here and below. So if the company comes to us and it happens all the time, hey, we have uh, Ultimakers. Um, so we're like, all right, cool. We're going to have to make it in 285. So that already sets a parameter. Um, we know we're going to have to keep it under, let's just say 285C, something like that. So maybe PCTG, PETG, ABS, ASA. Maybe one of, we have an easy printing polycarbonate. We call it easy PC, maybe that. So that sets that. Um, they have print cores on Ultimaker that are for fiber-filled materials. So we know we can maybe add some fibers to it there's so just the material just the machine that you're going to use starts to inform our potential solution um, often customers have i mean an aerospace company small guys start off with a couple machines and they want to get applications uh, printed that are beyond their current machines capabilities then we've we've got to work with them on that so we can either print parts for them sometimes it's a small company they just need 50 parts we can maybe print those parts for them uh, but ultimately, we'd like to prove the use case to to buy one of our machines. That that would really be our end goal uh, with a client like that. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So, um, you know, often we'll have a customer that says, hey, I need a peak part, but I've only got a low temp printer. They're either going to have to buy a machine or they're a parts customer at mm -hmm. that point. Correct. So. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us also a bit about like, um, you know, you, you're talking about these filled materials and stuff like that. You have a separate category of that. And you mentioned that, you know, this, you know, on the Ultimaker print cores, there's a wear solution. These materials are, are usually problematic sometimes as well for people, right? A lot of people are used to using, let's say, GF30 filled materials in automotive. Mm -hmm. Really common. Right. But if you want to put it through, you know, a lot of printers, it's just not going to work or it's going to work very, very badly. Like, tell us a little bit about that. Because I think a lot of people, if you're just coming from industry, injection molding, you're going to show up and you want... Ta -da, this you know PP 30 percent GF uh, uh, filled and that's that's going to be a bit problematic, right? Yeah, so that's a that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. So, with a lot of years of doing this, there's sometimes we get into a point of, of trying to guide the customer in the difference between what you can do and what you should do. And um, thirty percent glass filled PA six six, really Stand common material. Up. Yeah, the little Zytel, or I used to work for DSM, so I prefer to call it Aculon, you know. But uh, yeah, but the uh, the typical automotive grade of 6.6 material, um, I would dissuade clients and have dissuaded clients from making material out of 6.6. You, you'll see a, 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 a gap in the market where 6.6 really isn't offered. It, it, it's crystallinity, the way it's, it, 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 it um, freezes out. It just, it is, um, there's, probably a whole presentation we've talked about doing it just on the different types of semi-crystalline, amorphous, high-performance nylons. Mm -hmm. uh, but 6.6 six is just a, a not going to, I have made filament out of it and supplied it, uh, but it doesn't print really well. And so when a customer wants something that's similar, I've pushed them to say 30% glass filled six, which has a much better um, uh, printability to it uh, for, for a couple of good reasons. Uh, but another one, hey, I really need this uh, acetal. Acetel or Acetyl or Delrin or, oh, yeah. you know, it comes under a whole bunch of cool names, but that one there makes incredibly good filament. I have made great filament out of Acetel. Uh, it just prints horribly. It's got a 3% plus shrink rate. It potato chips up on the first layer. And no matter what you do for chamber temperature and bed adhesion, it's just not a good printing material. 
uh, but I've made it mostly oddly for satellite fuel. It, uh, I've, I've got some CubeSat customers that use it to um, oxidize and, and create a, a propellant um, out of the Delrin for, uh, for satellite fuel. Um, but it extrudes great. Um, it's got some limitations. You don't want to overheat it and what have you. Uh, but those are the kind of things customers have brought to us in the past is we, we want some Delrin filament. And mm -hmm. I can sell it to them with the caveat that it's just not going to print well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and other ones do print well. So we try to tell them, push, push them into areas that, that will mm -hmm. uh, maybe give them the performance they, they want that, that actually do print well. Okay, that's a good point. I think I think it's a nice uh, segue to a question by Bob Zolo, uh, who asked uh, if we have ever tried making filament. If you guys have ever tried making fil filament of ultra mole uh, high molecular weight uh, polyethylene, um, that's another fun one. I think <laughs> for yeah. a lot of people. That, uh, yeah, what are your experiences with that? Yeah, that actually in my head, I had a left or right. I was going to pick UMHW or Acetel to kind of. Uses that, that example. Uses that example. And I went down the acetal route just because um, it's 50 50 on that one. So um, we have made um, polyethylene filament for folks quite often. Oh, a couple of times, not quite often. And it, again, doesn't print well. Um, so the closest we have is an OBC material, uh, olefinic block copolymer. It's a polyethylene polypropylene copolymer that um, is in the polyethylene family more so than, than polypropylene. It's printable. It, it does many other things that a, that a polyethylene will do, but not necessarily UMHW. Um, these fractional melt flow materials like UMHW um, have a significant resistance to flow. So we can probably, you know, we didn't do some of the very, very low molecular weight or high molecular weight, low melt flow, fractional melt flows to make filament out of. But we could probably make some filament out of um, some of them. But again, because they're chain entanglement, um, the polarity, the morphology, everything wrong about that material to get layer to layer adhesion is probably going to create some pretty significant problems. Um, okay. And the parts are really ugly as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least in my experience, it's, I've tried we, to do we this. You can supply filament. I mean, that's as far right. as on that material. If somebody really wanted me to do it and they wanted to pay us, hey, look, give us 20 kgs of of a of a melt flow of polyethylene that we could actually extrude um i'd make it for them mm -hmm. but i wouldn't um mm -hmm. I'd, I'd make sure they knew i wasn't super optimistic about its printability okay i think it's a healthy approach i think it's a healthy approach it definitely also with palm or acetal it's also there's a safety uh, issue there you don't want to do that in a in a, in a ultimaker type of setup you wanted that in a yeah some kind of really uh uh, you know, uh, either under a fume hood or in some kind of like enclosed system as well. Over yeah, wouldn't, you uh, your print core and you've got hazmat in your office for a couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. exactly. So, so that's another thing you might want to say. This is another interesting question. Um, and it's what is the actual real world performance difference between CF and GF if layer adhesion is the main failure path? And I think here with layer adhesion, we mean in layer adhesion or in layer bonding in the parts or Z strength as we use, we use the same six that's words great. in the same term. That's a great question, right? You sure? It's all you. Yeah, that's a great question. We got that actually at a presentation about that years ago. Um, my background, I was the thermoplastics composites manager at Toria and Zoltec and before I started this. So um, I dealt with a lot of carbon fiber. And if you see our portfolio, if something sits still long enough, um, I'll probably try to put carbon fiber in it. Uh, carbon fiber and glass fiber uh, do a lot of really good things. Uh, they do some bad things, which I'll get to, but they do some really good things. One of the things they do is even on some of the semi-crystalline materials, which tend to be more troublesome to print, they lock down your coefficient of uh, uh, thermal expansion, your CTE. They, they lock down your warp, your shrink, uh, your lift. So even on some of the uh, more, uh, more, uh, more more crystalline materials, like a, like a PPA, um, like a Amadel or a um, Genstar or a uh, Zytel HDN, Pretty crystalline materials. Um, you throw some carbon fiber in there and you got to pick the right carbon fiber and the right percentage of it. Uh, you can get some pretty good dimensional stability, lift, warp, and shrink control and make some printable parts. It's, it's kind of nice. Um, glass fiber will do the same thing. So glass fiber, um, you control your CTEs quite a bit, uh, your shrink, whip, lift, and warp. Uh, but why would you pick one or the other? Um, glass fiber, inherently, you can color the resin. Um, so uh, off, you'll see some of our glass fiber grades have blues and reds and greens, and we've, we've leaned towards some of our um, 
military customers, guys who want to make flat dark earth or tactical tan, things like that. And uh, we have we have colored carbon fiber materials before, and you see some of that in the market, but you you basically have to over color it with five, seven percent coloring to get a shade of something. Uh, but inherently, it's kind of that Henry Ford material. It's any color you want as long as it's black. Um, glass fiber um, tends to be in a one to one um, more ductile. Uh, you end up with less brittleness. Um, the the fiber itself, let's say the fiber um, of a carbon fiber is, what's a good example? Um, I'm just going to pick here um, seven microns in diameter. Um, so you got a seven micron fiber that's got, a, I don't know, I'm going to pick something, 500,000 modulus. Um, Glass fiber is going to be around 15 microns in diameter and have probably a third or half that modulus. So to get the equivalent stiffness out of glass fiber from carbon fiber, you can put about 10 or 15% carbon fiber. You got to get to about 35 to 50% glass fiber to get to the equivalent modulus stiffness as you would. So carbon fiber is more efficient. You can get a specific amount of, of uh, stiffness out of your part that you really can't functionally get out of glass fiber unless you really heavily load it. Uh, glass fiber's advantage is I can load it up and it's not conductive. So some applications mm -hmm. you don't want to be ESD or conductive, whereas you start to get over about 15 to 20% carbon fiber, it percolates, you get conductivity. So that's a downside. Um, but the, the, the inherent disadvantage and advantage with respect to some of these isn't necessarily layer body. It's um, the, 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 fragility or the, the you really lost the, the, the ductility, the impact in elongation when you when you put a bunch of carbon fiber, whether it's injection molded or, or, or 3D printed, your um, elongation will go from say eight to 15% elongation in some glass fibers to one to one, maybe one to three at the most in some of the carbon fibers. So that's your, your, your elongation is your, 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 um, your elongation to failure in a say a tensile test. Um, mm -hmm. So you you tend to fail in carbon highly loaded carbon fibers due to brittleness before you would in glass fiber. Maybe talked around some of that, but there's just inherent advantages of why you might want to do either. Um, and quite honestly, some of these polymers are really bad to print with. Mm -hmm. So peak, mm -hmm. not a fun material to print with under any of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So if I can print with 20, 30 percent glass fiber peak, it is going to be significantly friendlier uh, to print with than say 10 to 15, 20% uh, carbon fiber or even better so than, than unfilled. So mm -hmm. hopefully that answers the question. I can open it up later for a, a discussion on the phone or anything to, to kind of jump into a, a specific question mm -hmm. if, if that didn't go deep enough. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's a good answer. It also depends what you want to do with the part. Like interlayer yeah. bonner is not everything. If you want to uh, compress the part or impact strength is important, then all of a sudden a lot of stuff goes out the window. Yes. Um, so uh okay next question uh how does the filament dryer work is it uh heat forced air convection uh how does it work well, I do, uh... yeah so um the filament dryer um is uh, primarily heat uh so the dryer goes up to 200 and or goes 300 I think. it goes to 300 yeah. but you don't need to go over yeah, 150 we it in the software so yeah. that it doesn't melt the real everything device. inside of it <laughs> so. um up to 150 is usually where um, your max drying temperature for your um, your peaks, pecs, and all temps, um, some of your cell phones. Um, and, and that's really where that goes um, up to for drying capabilities. Um, it is uh, heat based. Yeah. So this is a little bit deeper into this one because the filament maintainer is really uh, recharging desk and dryer. It Correct. maintains it, dries it long term. Um, I'm kind of a old school materials plastics engineer. If you just heat it up, that ain't right. This works. Um, so I pushed back when the engineers first brought this solution. I said, no, unless it's got some kind of a rotating desk and bed or switching kind of cores, it's not going to work. But we put a bunch of reels of Altem out, let them get wet for a couple of weeks and we put them in done. this thing. In four hours, it printed beautifully. So it's not supposed to without the desk and system, but uh, it works amazing. And then when the customers get done with that, this, this I guess the big picture on some of this, the, the 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 hc2 has four material bays that keep the filament dry long term but it doesn't dry the material and we had customers ask us well 
if you put a wet roll of Altem in there, what happens? Yeah, how, how, how doesn't it not dry it? And I said, well, you got a $100,000 filament dryer then, and you're going to tie it up for four to six hours while you wait for the filament to dry. I'd rather just dry it and load it with material and maintain it. So that's the route we went. And then the maintainer, customers will dry an array of materials that they want to keep uh, ready to print. And the maintainer actually keeps it at a you know moderate temperature. I think it's 60, 60 to 70. Like and But that does drive um, the, the technology that's in there is the same that's in the electronics industry that um, drives the board, uh, the, the storage cabinets for the boards down to a very low moisture content. And this is also really important because not only because print mistakes, but also establishing a baseline and then getting yeah. consistency, especially if you're going to manufacturing or if you want to do something medical, aerospace, that kind of thing, you are going to get the craziest results just because some small shipping error or somebody did something weird with the heat of the room or the yeah. air conditioning system changed, all that kind of stuff. So the consistency is there is a really important reason uh, for that uh, filament drying and maintaining as well. Um, the next question is from somebody who's doing some really interesting research because they want to know if you guys are making any piezo, uh, energy piezo materials uh, with where you share the formula as well, and also for softer tires. So I don't know what they're doing exactly, but they're in some really interesting uh, areas of research there. So spanning quite the gamut. And uh, yeah, so do you have any work uh, that you've done in that area? Yeah, so we had one customer uh, that we did some um, piezo works. I don't honestly know if we can share that. It's not something we... Um, we didn't make that. Yeah, we didn't make that. That's something they sent to us and we filmatized for them. Uh, but they were pretty happy um, and they, they bought a couple times. So um, we can, you know, if they email Brandon or email us, that's something we can look into to see if that's something that we can, we can talk mm -hmm. to other folks about, but that was a, a customer driven project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, this is, this is also a really interesting uh, question. It really goes to the methodology really. Uh, do you d share your design and experience strategy with the customer? Uh, is your DOE, uh, DOE approach published, public, or is it just kind of like the secret sauce that you guys uh, uh, will, will use internally for yourselves? Yeah, so um, that DOE that they make while they're um, while they're producing the production run, uh, while we don't publish that um, to the general public, uh, we do make sure that that is openly available to the customer for them to review um, as the project process as as they progress through the project. Um, so we that that's really there for um, our team internally already creates their um, their setup sheets and process guides as they make materials and update those as um, as we move forward. Um, but creating this DOE um, and having this implemented in the process was really for to be able to give the customer a little bit more of a deep dive into here's how we made this material for you. Um, so uh, so that they know, yes, we we actually did. We tried. 10 times, we tried 12 times, we only had to try twice. And then we got really good fulfillment out of it. And here's your processing setup. So if um, one of, if by some freak accident, everyone here at 3DX Tech gets hit by a bus syndrome, you know how to make this material again, um, or we know how to make the material again. It's really, it, it's really there for an open line of communication between us and the customer. Uh, but we do not publish that uh, to the general public um, just because mm -hmm. that's, that's that customer's project. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, another question is, what diameter tolerances can you hold typically? This is yeah, a bit of a tricky question again, because first of all, ovality is also a really, really important. Uh, we know, especially for certain, we mentioned Bowden two type uh, systems, especially there, ovality is really important. And also this kind of differs depending on what you're doing. But but just generally, do you have a published kind of tolerance level, plus minus a uh, millimeter or inches, or what do you, you want to share there? Yeah, so go ahead. generally speaking, we we publish 0.05 millimeter, um, plus or minus 0.05 millimeter. The vast majority of our business is 175, uh, um, and we publish 0.05 millimeters, plus or minus. Uh, some formulations are inherently uh, tighter, and some are more problematic. Uh, but that's that's kind of what we publish, and, and depending on which formula uh, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, and which machine, uh, we'll put a custom material in certain machines that are that are better suited for for what we're running them for. And that's okay. that's information that's relayed usually during the either consultation or formulation phase yeah. back to the customer to say, hey, 
in order to get X, Y, and Z properties, um, this was the material that was selected as your base material. But we've, when we've processed this before through countless times of, of process setups, we found that this material does uh, tend to have a, an ovality difference or a diameter difference of, of this, where our typical spec is here. Is that something that's acceptable? Or on the on the flip side, yeah, we picked a, a, a great material was selected. We're actually able to hold a tighter tolerance than, than typical on this. So it's, yeah, it's different with production materials. We've been running ESD PETG for years and we kind of know what to do with it. Um, sometimes we'll end up with 15 kgs of a material for a specific run like this. And there's no way to set up a stable process for that. So we get as much filament as we can. We've got um, dual axis uh, lasers that do 1500 scans, I think per second. Per second. And uh, we measure um, ovality um, and diameter and uh, then we have some secondary mechanical um, go no goes in our winding process. So there's there's some things we can do, but there's um, sometimes when you're when you're doing these small production uh, R and D runs, you by you the get time it, by the time you get you as have, close as you can. By the time you have the line in a stable setup, you're out of material. Yeah, but that's all okay. part. Of it. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, I think it's also a good point, but that you measure so many times a uh, second. Also, how many times do you measure and do you measure the entire length of the filament or just one point? Uh, uh, so that's, uh, I think, a really good uh, kind of approach. Um, any chance that you can produce PTFE, so Teflon filament? We know we use PTFE in tubes and um, on build plates and stuff. Could you make PTFE filament uh, in your machines? I know there's PTFA CPC could probably work because that's available, but uh, just pure, I think cause the person's really asking for pure PTFE filament, which would be um, a bit tricky, I think. Yeah, so um, it'd be more of RAM extrusion or, um, you mean, there might be some molecular weights that we might be able to do. We've done PFA in the past for customers. That was a little bit hairy, uh, but we've done that. Um, we do PVDF. Um, quite often, that's just one of our production materials. So if that um, floor polymer might be helpful for you. That's something we could do. And we we've done ESD. I've actually done carbon fiber PTFE. Um, maybe that's it. But there's some things we've done in in that. And again, we've we've done one run of PFA, but I don't think we've ever done uh, PBDF. Straight PBDF. Yeah, or I'm sorry, uh, PTFE. Yeah. Uh, the, the type of polymer it is doesn't really melt per se. You get a lot of movement under a lot of pressure, but I'm not sure we'd be able to to be able to do that in some of our machines. Yeah, actually, one of my sales guys came up to me the other day and asked about this one. Um, and I kind of drew a correlation to PVDF just because of some chemical similarities, um, where when we first launched PVDF, one of the biggest issues with it is we can make good filament out of it. The parts are functional. Um, the issue with PVDF comes in in the printing side of part of being a floral polymer is it doesn't, things don't stick to it. It's one of the great things about Teflon um, is things don't stick to it. Um, the inherent issue with that when it comes to 3D printing is getting it to stick to the build plate to form a solid foundation to print on top of. If yeah. something doesn't like to, anything to stick to it, it also just doesn't stick to things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so another question is who tests the filament to ensure the, pro uh, the properties of the pellets carry over to the filament? Now I think if I'm, is it just, just we're talking about final part properties or performance of the the the, the parts? Do, do you yeah do do you have an internal testing process for this dog bone type stuff or how does this work? Yeah, we printed more dog bones than anybody cares to ever think or look at. <laughs> um, but the it depends on what the customer is looking for. Um, just in, inherently, you're going to extrude this stuff. We have single screw extruders that don't really tear the machine the material up very much. I mean, if you're, we've, we've done so many studies on the retention of carbon in, in glass fiber link for customers. Um, um, say nylons are easy, you acid digest it, and you look at that. But from a compositional standpoint, uh, what molecular weight do you lose or a melt flow do you lose in each generation of processing? That's all been done a ton of times. Um, so if the project is take material X and give me filament and ship it in a box, that's kind of what you get. Um, if it's to create print profiles on our machine, um, some of that is printing a lot of test coupons to understand um, ideal um, extrusion temperatures, layer bonding, um, you know, and then some customers, they send us a ladder study of materials. It'll be um, Altem with three levels of something in it. 
and they want us to print coupons out of each one of them so that they can then do some down selecting to determine what they want as a more formal or a final product that we then go back to three to five months later and make a more production run out of out, out of the material they down selected. So it really depends on the project. Okay. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, the space to file frontier people are a bit different than uh, than somebody's just doing maybe prototyping with this and stuff like this. And also, it depends, you know, what the functional part is. Of course, if you're trying to make some breathing tube or something, you're gonna you know, care a lot more about that stuff and want to maybe do a lot more yourself as well, or an external lab even. Okay, another question: uh, What level of formulation area pellets would we need to add any additives for processing or stability, where they to the point where they could just be pigmented for custom color? Does it depend on the resin chemistry? This is a rather broad question. I think it's a good question. You know, can you master batch this? Do you have master batches, or yeah, do you need uh, additives for everything? Well, that depends. I think on a lot of different things, but but uh, yeah, just generally, what what, what do you guys think? Uh, yeah, so um, again, this really comes down in that consultation phase, we really go into a lot of this where on some of it, it is a ground up, we have to, I know if I need to use, if I need to hit a temperature resistance of X, and that means I need to go with a salt phone or a PEC or a Altem, um, but we they need increased in, impact performance or increased any kind of uh, property we then say, okay, I can take this base material and if I add some of this additive and this additive and this um, this carbon fiber, glass fiber, ESD, anything like that, that then gets us to our end, um, our, our end goal. Um, but then at the same time, if customers come to us and say, hey, I need this Pantone of blue, uh, we can then take that Pantone back to our color house um, and then they will get us with the best match uh, colorant for it. Um, and then that's just a pass through color match fee um, or if uh, there isn't a Pantone requirement to it, then that's more of a master batch situation where, hey, I, you guys, I see you guys don't have a, a purple, but I do need, it doesn't need to be this exact purple, but I need a purple and I need, volu I need volume of this material. Can you source a purple? Um, then easy. we can, yeah, then that's easy. We can just go to our color house and find out what, what stock purple we have, they have available for us. And we can send over a, a, a a, a file that shows what purple it's going to be. And then if we get approval on that, we'd source that really quickly, really easily and, and get it in. Okay. Well, we've, we've, we've looked at, we've, we've, we've had in, in some of our colors, we've had in, in some of our more um, general purpose lines, mm -hmm. PLA, PEGI, we've had as many as maybe 30 colors at times. And um, we end up selling black, white, dark gray. That's I mean, that's really what sells. Um, so we end up over the last couple of years, we've truncated it down to eight to 12, eight to 10 colors of really the ones that are in most demand. But if uh, we have a customer that needs this orange because it matches their company logo mm -hmm. and they, they produce all their fixtures out on their plant floor out of this ABS, it's ASA, right? ASA. it's ASA out of the orange that matches their plant logo or their company logo. We have made that logo color for them and they buy all their ASA from us, and it's out of that orange. Uh, Moog, mm -hmm. Aerospace. Yeah, it's burgundy. That burgundy is their logo, and it ran so well, and they bought so much of it, it's just a standard color for us now. So um, it's not special anymore. You know, it's special or John Deere. Yeah, John Deere green. They buy so much green from us, it's just our green now. Yeah. So um, if it's something special, we can do it. It's usually 25, 50 kg minimum, because we're not the 5 kg color guy. But if it's something you're going to buy all the time, we'll just add it to the portfolio and you can just buy it off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could also restrict that, right? If I, if I do enough volume, I could also tell you, no, no, I don't want anyone else to use my super special. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, cool, cool. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a really important question for a lot of people to get that color matching for logo, especially on the consumer side and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is by Alexander Wirth. Can you talk to us use, uh, about your use of dispersion agents and surface modifiers for compounding purposes? It's rather technical, but uh, also thank you for your ESD line. I've done lots of work with it over the years. Uh, so yeah, dispersion agents uh, and all these other kind of magical add-ins. So yes and yes. So yeah, we can talk about it and there's some, but um, I came from, say, the, let's talk carbon fiber, the simpler one. Um, so carbon fiber will come on the toe. Um, it'll get, uh, uh, essentially, they, they, they size the toe.
depending on the, with the chemistry, there's a sizing agent. It's get the, the, the toe gets spread out. It gets a sizing agent of a various chemistry, uh, phenoxy, uh, urethanes, amides, um, imids. There's a lot of different sizing chemistries that you can put on carbon fiber. Um, it gets chopped into generally six millimeter um, strands. They're little um, um, flakes almost. They, they're, they're fairly well bound together and that's what we feed into the twin screw compounder. And that, that sizing is meant for a couple things. That way you, it, you, you keep that box of carbon fiber um, in, a, in a controlled flake while you're feeding it so it doesn't uh, bird's nest on you. But also once you once you compound it into your uh, uh, your material, say it's compounded in halfway down the twin screw side fed, uh, you want it to survive the 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 um, addition into the to the melt. But once you get into that melt stream, that sizing is really there for to both protect um, the the fiber, but also to just help dispersion. So um, you you're really never going to get unfortunately, a lot of uh, covalent bonding or, or, or significant bonding to the carbon fiber. You get undercuts, you get a lot of mechanical binding, uh, bonding, but if you use the right sizing, you can uh, get really close to what would be um, um, some, some really good bonding to the fiber. And your, your pullout strength of the fiber increases significantly if you use the right sizing in, in the polymer matrix, and um, you, you retain a ton, a, a significant amount more on mechanical properties. Uh, so the urethane, for example, into a nylon or a polycarbonate um, works pretty good. There's other ones specifically I would use for, for say nylon than, than urethane, but um, that as you, as it melts, it's a poly, it's a thermoplastic um, uh, urethane um, sizing. It melts in the, in the melt stream and it helps distribute the, and, and disperse the fibers uh, so it protected it during feeding, but now it helps in dispersion. And because it's 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 wetted out to the fiber really well during the uh, sizing process, you get some really good bonding to the fiber. So it, it helps in dispersion, it helps in bonding and, and protecting it during the process. Glass fiber is a, a little bit friendlier uh, because you can actually get some mechanical, you can get some bonding, you can get some actual chemical bonding to the glass um, with some of those sizings that you can't necessarily get with, with carbon fiber. And so you might use a siloxane or, or some of the, the high temp uh, sizings with PPS or, or peak. Um, but each one of those are, are meant for both protecting it and dispersion while you're getting bonding. Um, carbon nanotubes are a little different. I, I used to be in the carbon nanotube business and, and now most of our ESDs are carbon nanotubes. Um, you can do some dispersion aids in some of that is is problematic for 3d printing because it uh, will, will will migrate to the surface and then you've, you've got some problems there the best thing for cnt's and all the studies i've seen in in, in every industry that i've been in for that semicon um, well, uh, aerospace what have you electronics is mechanical dispersion it does a really good job so you have to have the twin screws set up with the right configuration use not all cnt's are created equal uh, there's four or five really good companies out there, and each one of them disperse differently, have different levels of efficacy. Um, you can use maybe three to five percent, to say two to three percent of one, where it might take three to five percent of another, just because it doesn't disperse as well. So um, that dispersion, you can put aids in there for some things, but the best for what we've done is is really ideally the the mechanical uh, dispersion of the CNTs uh, works the best for us. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the different ways. I think yeah, different horses for courses. There are definitely, definitely. That's very, very specific to, to some really, really advanced use case. I think. Um, another question is, uh, yeah, somebody's saying they're an inventor, a contractor, and uh, yeah, filament structural properties are not my forte. Forte. Where do I turn? So I'm thinking like mechanical properties here. Mm -hmm. Like, where do I find those out? And also, like, there's another question here that that's kind of hidden in this question because it's nice that you have some mythical dog bone that may work or some bash that may work. Yeah. How do I actually obtain those properties consistently? Yeah. So this has always been the thing. So we did a lot of tense in injection molding to get a really good prototype part. You got to build a aluminum mold or do something. It's a lot of work. Um, so we have had some customers. I just, in the back of my head, you got all these guys who are doing these scientific modeling and putting great supercomputers to work to try to figure out if this part's going to work or not. Meanwhile, I could kind of print the part and see if it works. Um, it's 
that's part of what we do is, and overnight I can get you a part before you've even built your theoretical model on how to configure things. So part of the um, customer uh, discussion, whether we're just printing somebody a part or making a material is, you know, what its geometry is, what it's got to do, are there certain print orientations that will put the layer lines in a plane that are more favorable to the loads that are, that are going to be applied to it. Uh, we had customers once that were printing these parts and kept telling me it was droop, it was failing around this hole. And I looked at the part a hundred times and there's no hole in this part. Well, he was taking our part and drilling a hole in it. I'm like, why don't we print the hole in there? Why are you drilling the hole in this part? So helping customers out doing some of that. Um, if I recall the question before is about material properties, all of our stuff on the web has data sheets. Um, but to be fair, unless your part looks an awful lot like a tensile bar, they don't mean a lot. So that goes to um, just consulting with us and saying, hey, I'm trying to do X. I've got machine Y. What do you think um, will work? And, and we can help point folks in the right direction. Yeah. The best tip I give somebody on this is, by the way, to actual measure the actual print head temperature of your printer and the actual uh, uh, print chamber temperature and print platen temperature uh, using an external source like a FLIR or, uh, you know, maybe even like a laser, a simple laser, because uh, there may be differences between uh, your printer and the temperature that you think it is and uh, it is depending on where they place a sensor for example uh or other things like that so that's the that's where it starts like knowing your actual temperatures and how they deviate from from the model so yeah we've uh, got a lot of we've got a lot of those little grill probes that um on the the long metal wire that you stick into your steak um, we've got a lot of those around the office for hey i just i want to see what temperature the part is actually seeing not what temperature the thermal couple in the corner of the chamber is seeing yeah. they stick that next to the part close the door on the on the um on the cord and you're actually seeing yeah. what the what the part is seeing not what your lcd screen is telling you yeah yeah i think that's a really important point a lot of people have a different temperature and then if you start with 10 degrees more than you think you are everything's goes out the window and everyone's advice goes out the window and all the published uh, stuff goes out the window as well so that's a, the one thing i give everyone advice also start simple yeah. just print really really simple parts over and over and over again until you get the hang of a new material and realize that you know you change the color everything changes as well um and you change the, the and a lot of people especially in the beginning tend to buy too many materials and too many flavors before they really get their process stability down and this is another question the same uh thing it's our last question uh and yeah how okay this is a question generally about like it basically sums up our whole industry it's like okay how do we deal with uh the the film bed adhesion issue uh how do we deal with part warpage and uh you know how do we match the injection molding strength uh or equivalent with with the parts we make it's kind of like like what we're tr all trying to do <laughs> every day kind of summed up into one question i think yeah it's a bit difficult to answer but i think maybe you guys have some 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 handholds for 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 uh belagru uh to, to 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 start with i think so a couple of those are easy so if you guys look through the 3dprint.com webinar history we gave a presentation months ago i don't know four to five months ago about the effect of chamber temperature on the mechanical properties in your printed part and i picked a couple of materials i think altim 985 or mm -hmm. 1010 or something like that both of them are in there and um we varied the chamber temperature in our machine all the way down to you know way past ideal and and and, and pulled bars and saw what the, the the effect of of the layer adhesion was based on simply varying one um uh, one variable and it's significant so for example, like the data sheets that you might see might be a material X printed on a printer Y. Uh, unless you have material X on a printer Y, they're just instructive. They're not really what the, you know. So if you take RABS and put it in a Prusa, fine machine, I like them. It's gonna get you property X. If you put it in our printer, which has a, for ABS, a 95C build chamber, um, it's gonna give you better properties, better dimensional stability. Altem's a really good example. Some of our Chinese friends uh, in Tamsis, mm -hmm. fine folks. Uh, but if their chamber temp can only get to 90 um, peak in Altem, you're inherently stifling the uh, the the layer bonding and, and the dimensional stability and the what have you. You just can't get there as much as you can with say Altem 1010. It's ideal chamber temp is 225C. Uh, if you look at Stratasys's print parameters for their Fortises, it's 225C for a reason. They've had 30 years to figure this out. 
Um, so if you're if you're limping by at 220, you're limping by at 120, 130 in some machines, 90, you're going to print an all 10 part. If it's size of a grapefruit, you're probably OK. But you start getting bigger than that. You're going to introduce a lot of um, stresses and not have the mechanical bonding and layer strength. And that's that's on our website. We've got, a, I think, a link to that, mm -hmm. we do. but also in the 3D print dot com. Now, getting to mechanical properties of injection molding, that's kind of the, what is it, would be the white whale, maybe, yeah. or the, the holy grail, or what have you. Some some properties, you know, X and, X and Y, you're, you're there, sometimes, you know, really close. Z, of course, is a problem. Some technologies I've seen out there that are kind of niche uh, can, can get you closer, um, but it really comes down to, um, it is what it is. I mean, there, there's some technologies that, that get close, uh, but if 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 you have to have injection molded uh, Z strength, you're look at redesigning, orienting your part differently, um, or um, you know using. I've seen some some really niche technologies that say they can do it. I just haven't seen it repeatable. But that's always Z is always if you get fifty percent, kind of like a weld line in a a double injection. Um, what do you call it? A lot, of, a lot of the tensile bars have, you can inject from two different directions. You end up with a weld line in the middle and you pull it. Often your 3D printing is going to be about like that. You're mm -hmm. going to get weld line strength, essentially, which isn't bad. There's weld line strengths. There's weld lines all throughout your injection parts often. Uh, but you just got to place those weld lines in areas of low stress so that you can take advantage of the strength of the material. And this is kind of no different. You got to design your part and orient it in your printer in a way that you you you. you put the, the stress in a, in a more predictable and favorable way. Yeah. And this, it goes to a metaphor that we, we use quite a bit around here is it's the FDM 3d printing, FFF 3d printing is it's a tool in the toolbox. Yeah. Um, and if I need it, if I only needed a hammer to fix every single project in my house, all I'd have is a hammer. Yeah. Um, but at home I need a bandsaw and I need a hammer and I need a screwdriver and everything like that to get all my projects done. This is a machine. This is a tool to be used at your disposal. Um, and it's like, if I were to look at a, uh, a resin printer compared to an FDM printer and say, all right, well, how do I, what do I go to an OEM and say, Hey, what do I need to do to get my FDM part to look as good as my, my SLA part? It's like, it, we, we, it's not what it's meant to do. Um, yeah. And there's, there's spots where FDM shines, there's spot where uh, DLP shines and SLA shines. And there's areas where injection molding shines. And that's really what we're trying to do is, is fill those holes to make sure that if you do have the right tools at your, cap at your, at, at your disposal, you can then choose, hey, I've got this application which needs these uh, parameters. I'm going to use this tool for it. Now I need these parameters. I'm going to use this tool for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's great. Great. And I think one other point I would like to make is, hey, okay, all right, why do you want to have this injection molding property? Is that to, to pitch it in a meeting? Do you want a safety blanket for yourself to feel good? Because actually it's kind of useless because even if you would match them on the material on the dog bone or whatever, what are, what part are we actually printing under what conditions and where are we going to put that and to what stresses are we going to subject that part? And yeah. I'm saying, well, you're probably going to have to, especially in the beginning, if it's a load bearing part or something like that, uh, you're probably going to actually want to know what strength that part is in the, the type of uh, forces you're going to be subjecting that part to. And, you know, so, so even if we could equal that part, in a dog bone somewhere, you know, maybe it won't work for you, or maybe we'll have an access of strength and compression strength uh, for that one part for that one design. But if we change it a little bit, it's not going to work at all. Um, so the last question is uh, from Drew, and then what are the minimum purchase requirements? Does it vary by material choice? So you've kind of answered, kind of gave a ballpark kind of thing, but, yeah. but just to give it a little bit of an idea of people saying, hey, you know, if I want to talk to you guys, what kind of makes sense? Yeah, so um... The minimum uh, minimum order quantity um, really depends on the material. It's usually it's typically based on a time frame. Um, so during the pellets to parts program, um, the initial um, the initial buy in, if you want to call it that, is it's one day of production time um, on our extrusion line. So mm -hmm. if it's a relatively easy material and you're like, hey, I need PLA just in my Pantone color, I know in a day of production I can get. 49.2 kgs of material off an extrusion line in a in a given day or for that was probably yeah. a bad example because we PLA runs really fast but yeah um, then you go to a slower running material that in order to 
hold good tolerances, it has to run slower. In that same amount of time, you might get half of the amount of material. And those are things that are all communicated um, during the consultation and formulation phase um, as we go into it so that the customer knows what to expect when, uh, when the material is delivered. Yeah, it's, okay. so roughly, it, it can literally span from 20 you know, kgs to yeah, 20 kgs of something up to even more. It's just three to thirty thousand dollars is, is is usually what we've done. But it, again, if a company says if you add this red to your portfolio, we'll buy it all the time. That's a different thing, you know. So it just depends on on the application. And those higher numbers that you're hearing Matt talk about um, really come into play with the validation phase um, for- um, That's a lot of engineering time. It's a lot of engineering time. And during the, in the quote, you would see, hey, you're, you're getting, for the validation of to create the profile in HT2, you're getting X amount of engineering hours where the profiling team will be working on profiling that material. And it's this amount per hour. Um, and that's really where you start to get up to that $25,000, $30,000 for, for the engineering time. If it's just, I need this material in this color and I already have a machine or I'll worry about that later. Then those are the, those are the, usually that lower end where we extrude it and ship it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much guys. I think we actually went like 15 minutes over time because there were so many good questions coming in. So I really, really would like to thank the audience very much for your attention and also the good questions. Sometimes you get a bunch of people that are just like not engaged. And now we really got some really good, really interesting questions. Uh, really, really enjoyed that and uh, really, really enjoyed your presentation as well. So, so also thank you very much to Brandon and Matt. If you have any questions, just shoot uh, Brandon and Matt an email, reach out to them uh, or go on their website, look at the post to parts program, fill in the form and then, Boom, you can get in touch with them and figure out if this is for you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. I, I, th I think it was really help helpful and I uh, hope you guys learned uh, a lot today. And uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't forget to reach out to 3DX Tech if you think this could uh, be beneficial to you. And yeah, thank you very much for attending, everyone. And thank you very much. Have a great day. My name is Joris Peels of 3dprint.com. This is our 3DX Tech uh, webinar from pellets to parts. Have a great day.